The warped scene is one of the most enduring cinematic staples. From the dazzling warps-inspired musical numbers choreographed by Busby Berkeley in 1930s musicals, and the spiralling showstoppers performed by Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, the waltz continues to inspire displays of passion and romance, even in the unlikeliest stories. They can bring together stars of silent comedy, those who imitate them, and even our most dashing Hollywood icons. In this video, we'll see the Grand Waltz at its most spectacular, moving across the world from Old Vienna, where the dance originates, to the more intimate corners of cinematic ballrooms past and present. So come, take your partner by the waist, and let's dance through film history in three-quarter time. dance really the lady takes her place slightly to the left of the leading gentleman six basic steps and that's all I couldn't have put it better myself as this scene from Guillermo del Toro's 2015 film Crimson Peak illustrates the waltz is the simplest of ballroom dances in which the partners revolve around the floor in three-quarter time that's one two three one two three one two three. cinematically it is perfect to establish a silent connection between two characters locked in a gaze, their bodies close together, shutting themselves off from everyone else in the room. It can be fast, or it can be slow, but if the camera remains with the dancers, it can give the impression that it is the world which is moving around them. Reverse shots to characters looking on reveal their judgments, creating an elegant framing device for dynamics to be established, all without it being necessary to say a word. The intimacy that the waltz creates between two people has made it a conventional means of establishing a film's romantic core. The advent of sound cinema inspired a wave of musicals, often tied to national heritage, such as Ingeza von Bovary's 1930 film Two Hearts in Waltz Time, which gives the waltz a sexier update than that which we might typically associate the dance with. Not that it was immediately greeted with respect. The intimacy of the dance made it shocking when it came to Vienna, but was fashionable from the 1780s before reaching its peak in the heyday of waltz king Johann Strauss II in the mid-19th century. As seen in this 1938 American picture, The Great Waltz, loosely based on Strauss's life, it caused something of a sensation. Of course, one waltz has captured cultural imagination, above any other. What was that phrase you played that I like so much? Oh, I don't know. I do. Look, it just fits. What? Then you so blue, so blue, so blue. Anders Schoenen Blauen Danau, or By the Beautiful Blue Danube, was really only a mild success when it was premiered in 1867, by contrast to the depiction of its composition in this early Alfred Hitchcock film from 1934, entitled Waltzes from Vienna. The film comes after a series of films popular in the 1920s, inspired by 19th century Viennese operettas, largely made in Germany and Austria, including The Merry Widow by Eric von Stroheim. It's a genre that has been almost completely lost to time, although the waltz has endured. This extraordinary montage from the ending of The Great Waltz combines the most classical of musical works with the editing techniques of Soviet cinema pioneered by Giga Vertov in Man with a Movie Camera. It draws a connection between mechanics and industry with the waltz itself and shows how the Blue Danube was able to spread so quickly across the globe. And of course, in its best known cinematic usage, the Blue Danube was even launched into the Earth's orbit when Stanley Kubrick created a waltz with spaceships and stations in his 1968 film 2001 A Space Odyssey. Pour que l'amour commence à ronde, que manque-t-il Une valse. Voici la valse. 
The circling motion of the waltz lends itself to a form of travel, including turning back the clock. German director Max Ophels used this device in several of his glamorous post-war pictures, including La Ronde from 1950. Avez-vous de bonnes nouvelles de votre mari? Excellent, merci. And the earrings of Madame de from 1953. Here the waltz forms a continuous motion during cross dissolves and changes of costume to signal the passing of time. We're moving now into the Technicolor era, where the opulence of the Habsburg dynasty became a go-to setting for Hollywood spectacle. In Billy Wilder's musical The Emperor Waltz from 1948, we get the impression that Bing Crosby has stepped back in time due to the contrast in costume although he's actually supposed to be a contemporary gramophone salesman. Meanwhile, in Austria itself, the 1955 film Sissy, directed by Ernst Marischka, quickly became a national classic. It's a lavish, nostalgic vision of Elizabeth of Austria, known as Sissi, played by Romy Schneider, and her meeting with Emperor Franz Joseph I, played by Karlheinz Böhm, filmed in the spectacular Schönbrunn Palace itself. The film, as well as its two sequels, draw on the conventions of waltzing etiquette in order to explain the royal controversies to a modern audience. However, the films largely avoid a lot of the conflict that affected the Habsburgs during Sisi's lifetime, including the Meierling incident and the difficulties that the Empress herself faced. A more personal perspective of Sisi has been the subject of the 2022 film Corsage, directed by Mary Kreutzer, in which Vicky Cripps plays a more honest and human version of the Empress. Then in the right moment, so. So, and then. The film reveals the difficulties she faced in her life and how she could use the traditions of Imperial Austria, including the waltz, to find some freedom in an oppressive role. Wir haben heute einen berühmten Wiener Kapellmeister hier, Herrn Johann Strauss. Er spielt wundervoll. Moving out of Austria, the waltz quickly became a cultural export to other courts. Before making Sisi, Ernst Marischke directed Romy Schneider as Queen Victoria of England in the 1954 film Victoria in Dover, a marriage of cultures represented again in 2009's The Young Victoria between the Queen and Albert of Saxe Coburg and Gotha. Here we see the court of Puyi, the final emperor of China, dancing to Strauss's Kaiserwalzer in Bernardo Bertolucci's 1987 biographical drama, The Last Emperor. The music is out of step with the 1920s setting of Imperial China, signaling the death knell for the Chinese monarchy in the growing wake of Maoism. Years to His Majesty the Emperor. 10,000 years! <laughs> The spread of the waltz through social circles and cultures across the world has seen it appear in a vast array of literature, including Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace and Anna Karenina. In the case of the latter, putting the jealousy of the characters on screen through the waltz fully exploits the intimacy and sexual tension of the dance as we see in the same scene from the 1997 and 2012 film adaptations here. Kitty watches as Anna dances with Count Vronsky, establishing the sexual tensions between them across a crowded ballroom floor. Make your dancing gracefully across my memory. Those tensions exploded in the Russian Revolution of 1917, depicted in the 1997 animated film Anastasia, which revives the waltzing ghosts of the Romanov court in this spectacular musical number set in the ballroom of the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. It's a device also used by Alexander Sokorov in his 2003 historical film Russian Ark. Using a single shot through Russian history in the Winter Palace, now the Hermitage Museum, Sokorov follows the similarly ghostly Russian elites as they leave a ball, playing to the dramatic irony of the revolution soon to come. <laughs> 
waltzes capture the bitter sweetness of a nostalgia for bygone national eras in the wake of socio-political shifts, from Gustave Flaubert's Madame Bovary. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, this is a waltz and I don't waltz. It's quite I easy. Could show you. Oh, no. No, I, I should be afraid to try. <laughs> to Giuseppe Tomasi de Lampedusa's The Leopard, and Edith Wharton's The Age of Innocence. On the whole, Archer was amused by the smooth hypocrisies of his peers. He may even have envied them. The waltz! Quick, the waltz! Lights! The lights! That romanticism has retained its place in the cultural imagination, to the greatest extent in the continued charm of Disney princess movies. For all the social and political changes that lie underneath the warps in literature and historical drama, Disney has held on to its purest use as an establishing moment between a man and a woman at the start of romance. They're all looking at you. Believe me, they're all looking at you. There's certainly criticism to be made of the idealised vision Disney has implanted in children, especially young girls awaiting their prince to take them by the waist and sweep them off their feet. Moving from Cinderella to Beauty and the Beast, it was the intention of screenwriter Linda Wolverton to create a version of the princess myth which would give young girls a more intellectual role model, using the 1756 fairy tale to show that there is more to romance than just beautiful people waltzing together. Of course, the male animators at Disney were less hot on Warburton's ideas, and modelled Belle on a number of Hollywood stars, including Audrey Hepburn and Vivian Lee. For the 2017 live-action remake, Emma Watson insisted that Belle did not wear a corset in the grand ballroom scene for her waltz with the Beast, by contrast to Lily James in the remake of Cinderella, once again trying to shift but maintain the dreamy princess fantasies that the waltz continues to represent. Oh, I just love happy endings. Yes, I do too. Oh, blue. The meaning of the waltz may have shifted greatly over time, but its placement in Disney is perhaps its greatest legacy. Indeed, it is such a calling card for the heights of fantasy romance that Disney animators directly recycled the animation cells from 1959's Sleeping Beauty for the finale of 1991's Beauty and the Beast. For all its varying uses in film history, the waltz may still be best associated with a truly spectacular happily ever after. Oh, oh.